Hello and welcome to Postgres FM, a weekly show about all things PostgreSQL. I am Michael, founder of PG Mustard. This is my co-host Nikolai, founder of Postgres AI. Hey Nikolai, what are we going to talk about today? About parallelism. Parallelism. Uh, are you trying to say it multiple times at the same time? Um, yeah, right. I, we've had. In I, fact, I did it sequentially. Talking... I did it sequentially. Nice. And we. By had the way, do two... you know? Do you know that? Par- Sorry for interrupting. I I will try to do it less often, but do you know that parallelism is works well with sequential operations, and and so on. And this is where it shines. Like if something needs to be done sequentially, their parallelism can be applied. Yeah, it makes sense, I guess, because it's it's like it's it's like axiomaron, right? Because parallel query means. I see what you mean. (laughs) Like a dichotomy. It's like almost like it feels like it shouldn't be the case, but it is very much. It's not my thought, by the way. It's uh, from Mm -hmm. Thomas Munro, who who contributed a lot to to parallel parallelism of. Uh, various operations again uh, sorry for interrupting let's no all i was gonna all i was gonna say was that we've had two requests for it um this is one of those topics where we have had multiple requests um not in parallel i guess but yeah so people are keen to know like how how parallel query works specifically some pros and cons um Somebody wants to know more about parallel query in general. I think pa- talking about parallelism overall makes sense as well, like a bit of an overview. So I'm glad you uh, added those bits in. So yeah, looking forward to this one. Um, do you want to start with what it is or a bit of history? Yeah, let's start uh, for, for history. Uh, I, I must admit, I'm not a big expert on this topic. Of course, I know many things, but I'm far from being an expert and I see... Uh, like you know, like I don't see bottom in some places. If if you if you get what I'm what I mean, like I in think, some places I see, I need to dive deeper to to see the bottom. Well, I'm. I think from previous conversations we've had, that sometimes uh, it's a sign that you are an expert if you realize quite how much there is that you don't know still. Um, but but this yeah, is one of course. topics where I, I I I feel my weakness. So like disclaimer. Sure. Yeah, and I've only looked into this from a, like, I've obviously done a bit of reading for this episode, but previously looking into just performance of queries in general and having to read around things, um, having to write some things for it as well. So, yeah, mine is only surface level two compared to people that have written this. But I think a lot of people don't even necessarily realize that Postgres can run queries in parallel, that it can do certain oper- it does. Pre- operations. It's not just yep. can, it does all the time. And, and, uh, if like I'm uh, usually my uh, experience is uh, closer to OLTP, and it's, it makes sense because Postgres is uh, the best OLTP database mm-hmm. system. But some people, of course, do some heavy uh, analytical kind of queries, and uh, of course, like I remember how uh, parallelism appeared in first in nine point six, two uh, easy to remember six six right uh, and so on and but you need to remember that uh, nine point seven became ten so two thousand seven but it was not d- enabled by default in two thousand sixteen and nine six correct and um, I remember there were fears that in OLTP context it's, it doesn't good it's, it's not a good idea to have it because it's more for analytical queries uh, let's enable it uh, dynamically for particular queries only because of course it has some overhead uh, yep. if you enable it it has some overhead so for ltp we want like only like single core operations and not but eventually uh, right now we live with it enabled by default and we see benefits uh, and so on. Of course, sometimes uh, application produces not optimal, suboptimal queries, uh, even, so, even sometimes having sequential scans or heavy index scans. And in this case, uh, parallelism works well, like part- sl- improving the speed and, and so on. But unlike, for example, uh, just uh, just in type uh, j- JIT, uh, which yep. we usually recommend disable for LTP. Well, so this is similar. Recommend usually enable, and, and it's interesting. I think it's a similar conversation, and the difference is that the 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 defaults are better for the parallelism uh, settings. I think the JIT one basically. I don't think the cost 
uh, estimations are quite right. I think maybe we could, maybe we would be able to leave that one on more if it had a higher cost threshold or it had some costing improvements. But I think parallelism costings are a bit better and it tends to not. What about planning time? Many. Planning time also affected, right? Yeah, good point. I'm not sure about the, I'm, I haven't seen many parallel queries that also explode planning time. So I don't think it's as bad as things like number of joins and things. So it's, yeah, I I haven't seen it cause excessive planning time issues. I don't. Know yeah, the reason I, the reason I, the reason I'm talking about this is because like we definitely now live in the world where uh, JIT probably should be disabled for LTP cases, but parallelism should be enabled sometimes sometimes uh, tuned, and uh, we we'll, we we'll see it works well. Like every release, we have improvements, and it works well. And it makes total sense to me. By the way, we, we needed to mention that we are not going to talk about uh, parallel execution on multiple nodes, like some, like, I don't know, like a green plum side or so, all those systems. We talk about only single node parallelism inside one machine. Yeah, right? yeah. This is uh, important Core to, dis to distinguish. Right, yeah. and uh, also like to, to frame what we have, we have uh, it only for uh, read operations, Plus a different level for some other operations like vacuum only, manual vacuum, explicit vacuum, and uh, PG restore, and so on. But uh, for queries, it's only for reads. We don't have it for writes still. But like for example, parallel copy would make total sense, but it's still under development. Yeah, we do yeah. have it for similar things like create table and create index, uh, create materialized oh, view. Oh, it's also writes. View. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. We can, but, um, we can consider yeah. them right uh, queries also, but the DL queries uh, for DML queries, it's only for read, read only for reads. Yeah. So select with these queries, uh, and uh, this is like since 2016, first non-default. Next year, it was already became default in in version 10, former 9.7, and uh, then it was developed better, better. Every year, we have a bunch of improvements. Yeah, I think it's interesting, like it's a couple of things about those first few versions. I think it's really interesting in 9.6, it was released, it was very limited in scope, but still useful for people. So it, I think it only supported sequential scans, a couple of join operations. And it was, as you say, it was off by default. And that was controlled by a, a very important setting. I think if, you're to, if we're going to be talking about this, it's um, max parallel workers per gather was set to zero. So that meant it couldn't use any extra work. Each query couldn't use any extra workers. And that in version 10, a couple of big improvements. One was that more scan types were added. So index scans, uh, index only scans as well for B tree indexes um, and bitmap uh, heap scans as well. The heap part of those could be parallelized. Huge, huge improvements. Um, and that max parallel workers per gather was bumped to two, which meant we could get three um processes by the like uh, by default on a query that could that supported parallelism so one that suited it uh, we could get up to three cores working on our query at the same time right and let's let's maybe mention like in this context so so i remember in, in 2016 17 I, I remember we played with uh, some selects trying to understand is it worth having uh, it enabled by default, even mm -hmm. in 9.6. And I remember examples when I, we saw uh, very clearly that uh, overhead like, brings some penalty, so it's better not to enable it. But then somehow I lost traction, and then I, we already live in a world where it's everywhere enabled, and we see it's beneficial, and if we check examples. I think it's very doable to find examples where you disable parallelism for some query, and you see that it's better in terms of in terms of what, by the way, time and buffers, maybe, right? But buffers. Well, eventually, time. Time is the most important for mm -hmm. end user. Uh, user doesn't like. Well, user m might care about buffers, but only uh, those which produce final result, which goes to the user. Because if it's like a terabyte to download, it's not good. Right? But uh, buffers here are also important, and overhead uh, I think exists in terms of both. And uh, so it's it's good to check both when we analyze. Uh, and uh, make decisions based on that. On that, but let's let's maybe mention what, like why parallelism is important at all. 
philosophically and like theoretically and so on. Uh, I have the, some, I have some, I think I know where you're going with this, but I have some other, like, yeah, let's do the obvious ones first. So well, if we have, uh, we have a lot of CPUs. This is, yeah. Key. And a growing number, like in the, the modern world, it's quite common to have a lot of CPUs available It because people often scale up their database size. And especially in the cloud that comes with lots of cpus like so the, it's... The, the key the key problem is that uh, cpu uh, in general c cpu development processor development uh, uh, went into direction where one core uh, cannot be improved uh, as before like we had this uh, house called the law when most law right, right, right i think <laughs> right so obviously the makers of cpus intel amd uh, they decided to bet on multiple core approach, and we now mm -hmm. have hundreds of cores easily in cloud. It's very like it's, it's relatively cheap, especially on some kind of uh, spot instances. You can play with more, like very interesting. You can run a very interesting benchmarks on very uh, interesting hardware, and uh, and this this means that application needs to uh, be adjusted because. You cannot say like okay, now we need we need like we want uh, to benefit from having multiple cores, but unfortunately, application needs to be changed to benefit from it. It cannot be done transparently in most in most cases. Sometimes it can be done in some trivial cases when mm -hmm. work can be paralyzed somehow and like for example, well again like it's a different topic, but some 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 uh, algorithms. Algorithms can be paralyzed, but I remember even some languages exist, like extensions to C and so on. It's from my university 20 years ago. I already forgot everything, but uh, obviously to make Postgres benefit from uh, multiple cores, it, it needed to be heavily reworked. By the way, I remember also in 96 uh, a lot of a lot of a lot was a lot was was done to uh, reduce contention in shared buffers. It's also important. So a lot of areas need, need to be improved to benefit from multiple cores. And of course, if you have a few users, but uh, like many, many more cores, like you have only like 10 sessions, but you have 96 cores. Uh, okay, yeah, so you, imagine... three, three auto vacuum workers default. Like it sounds like m most of cores will be underutilized and it's not good. Right. This is the key. Uh, this the development of modern hardware dictates how to build software. Right? Yeah, it's an, it's an, there's an opportunity there, right? Like especially for things that are very easy to parallelize it, by giving it access to three times the workers. We, we're not going to get a three times improvement because, as you said, there is some overhead, but we could get close. Like it's not uncommon, especially once you bump that number up, to get close to the number of workers. Uh, times the uh, benefit so so there is this huge potential not as much as in indexing you know you see whenever you see a, a blog post that says we how we sped up our database thousand x in in one easy step it's that's never going to be parallelism um, but it th so that's going to well, be unless like you switch from one cpu to thousand cpus and uh, sc scaling linearly it's which is very with a uh, fanatic they can be imagined already but uh yeah, but an interesting example: if you dump PG Bench and PG, PG dump, you have PG Bench table, you do some benchmark, mm -hmm. you created that one terabyte database, which uh, obviously all one terabyte will go to PG Bench accounts uh, table. Yeah, the other tables initially are empty, and uh, then you say, okay, I'm I'm going to test uh, dash j option of pg dump because pg dump uh, uh, allows you to to benefit from multiple cores and you say okay i have 96 cores so i expect my pg dump okay not 100x but at least like okay 20x i will be already happy almost right and you start dumping and see no no benefits at all why <laughs> because it uh, dash j can work with uh, when you have ma many tables only. If whole your database is a single table and others are, the other tables are empty, pgdump cannot paralyze it. 
but so is that that I but, thought that was like a practical limitation because the work hasn't been done, or is it a theoretical limit? Like, is there some reason? It's just why how it parallelization of pitch dump is implemented. It's sure. Implemented okay. Great. At, at at database level, not it cannot parallelize a single table unless it's partitioned. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> well, it's not really one table anymore, but yeah, it's a nice link and, to that. But and a couple of years ago, a special option for PG Bench was added. So now you can create when you create PG Bench database uh, dash i initialize it. You can say I wanted to have partition uh, PG Bench accounts, and then you, uh, you can speed up your dump. And this is interesting example showing that like there are many places where parallelization can be tricky. Yeah. Well, it's while we're talking about power, like the parallel query side of it, I think it is obviously it's worth giving a shout out to the people that that did this is a huge amount of work to get it in at all and make it safe, uh, make it performant. Then it did improve a lot in versions 10, 11, and it kept improving. There were kind of smaller improvements and performance improvements in 13, 14, even 15 recently. So it has, it's something that went in and has continued to get better, which is normally a sign that people are using it and want it to be, um, wanting it to be better. I'd say another reason it got added, uh, this is like not, uh, it's the same reason, but uh, a second order effect was that this was around the time I think that people were starting to think about alternatives to Oracle and SQL Server. So I think a lot of a lot of people migrating were probably struggling. This is a theory based on who was working on the on the feature and like which consultancies they were working for. But this isn't the kind of this isn't a, I don't think this was a passion project for people who are excited about working on this. Yeah, there I is demand. Came from, there's real need, exactly. Right. And let me finish with reasons uh, yeah. dictated by hardware. It's not only about CPU. I see in many articles people mention CPU, like we have many cores, let's do it. But it's not on. Ah, and of course, uh, very important that Postgres is still uh, process based, not thread based. Yeah, so it's, it's all, all, all also interesting. Uh, so, so like it, it's also important, uh, and uh, this is how Postgres works. So, so for parallel, uh, for parallelism, it needs to run multiple processes and then uh, find a way to communicate with, between them. Mm -hmm. But I want to, to highlight, like, to emphasize a very important point. Uh, it's not only about uh, CPUs, of course, about CPUs and, and uh, multiple cores and, and so on, but it's also about disks. This is often overlooked in explain, when people explain why we need parallelism. They forget mention that now we are on SSD, and to get maximum of it of SSD, you need uh, to do multiple threads or i mean multiple processes you cannot uh, get full speed of ssd if you if you read uh, in a single thread oh, you need interesting like 16 point. threads to to saturate this io uh, you need uh, multiple if for example f f io few uh, very good tool to benchmark disks if you use single threaded benchmark you will never reach uh, saturation you need uh, like eight 16 uh, threads and this means that uh, like to go full speed especially if you have heavy queries you definitely uh, need multiple threads or multiple processes and the communication with, with between processes uh, so disks are, in my opinion are very important but couldn't so here's a question couldn't that be an argument for having more connection like allowing more users for example rather than like it's it's, it's, it's not both. necessarily a, it's both. Okay, yeah. Of course, like, well, if you have a lot of small small like small queries in parallel, of of course, this is a different uh, area. We uh, this is what I mentioned in nine six. The, the, there was big improvement in in, in how like to, re to reduce contention. Uh, uh, how we work with, with the buffer pool is organized. I remember a great uh, work from in post blog post from Alexander Korotkov towards 1 million TPS on single node. Uh, they did, like, it's, it was interesting that it was done around the same time when MySQL did it as well. And they worked We've mentioned it together. a few times, yeah. Right, it's interesting. And, uh, but it's not related to a processing of a single query. It's related to multi-user, multi-session uh, mm -hmm. uh, pro mm -hmm. processing. 
Uh, but uh, parallelism for single session is needed when, again, you have many cores, you have much fewer, and this, and this is actually normal, much fewer uh, active sessions right now. If you have more sessions, active sessions than cores, it's not a good position already. Like, I, I, I mean, usually we have some room. If we don't have this room, if we have 96 cores and more than 96 active sessions, I suspect this we saturated already either CPU or like most most likely CPU. It's not a good position. Like, but uh, if, usually we have some room, and why not to to use some room and speed up one query and reduce contention as well? It will be it will be executed faster, and we will have average uh, active session number going slightly down. It's good. And let us let us see. Yeah, I was going to ask, is this because, so we've we've got um, a good note in the docs. I think actually the Postgres docs on parallelism are great. Are they far, in far more detail than I was expecting when I first looked it up? Um, I think they really do explain it well. Uh, one thing, a, a, a note that they make is that this, is, this isn't just about slow queries. This isn't just about uh, querying lots of data, it's querying lots of data and returning few of those rows. It's it's uh, it's not as likely to make a big difference to your queries if you're having to return all the rows anyway, because of the overhead of of sending that data over the network is likely to dominate the the time. But if we're doing aggregations, well, yeah. sure, depends. sure. But the the big benefit here is in, in kind of aggregate queries or things that are heavy and, queries. And, Heavy queries that are returning some summary of that information or only returning a, a mm. small, uh, which normally is the only justification for doing a heavy query, right? If you're doing a heavy query and then not returning most of it, it's... That's why uh, I, I think buffers first analysis of single query matters here at all. A lot you need to pay attention to buffers and see what's inside, how many bytes, how many pages were involved in query processing and uh, compare parallel non parallel tune it yeah. with this in mind right so that's a good point you you point? return just one row like like average uh, aggregate but uh, mm -hmm. inside it you needed to process a lot of buffers and this yeah. explains why it's so hey so i was a bit surprised when when you said like i get the impression you don't turn off parallelism for some of your like let's Customers say you've got a lot don't. of rltp they don't, but would you, if you had the choice, do you think? Uh, it depends. I would probably do some um, benchmarks. Uh, I mm -hmm. would uh, analyze the content of PGC statements, uh, create some, uh, art, like, I call it, uh, uh, how I, how do I call it? I forgot. Macro benchmarks? Macro be no, 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 no. Uh, Simulated workload or something like I I, I sure, already okay. forgot how I call it. Sorry, uh, word uh, out of my mind. So so I I would uh, create some s uh, test set mm -hmm. and just run multiple uh, multiple iterations, uh, checking uh, the p even probably just in single thread as usual. Like I I do it in sm some sometimes in shared environments where I don't care about time a uh, lot. I I, I just see. Uh, how much data, how much buffers were involved in processing in, with, without realism, with realism, it will give me idea. Of course, it's not directly converted to time, but quite, it's, it's the biggest, uh, it, it, it will influence the most, uh, the resulting time. And um, uh, here, of course, in parallel, in parallelism, we, we can understand, like, uh, we uh, uh, re reading uh, thousand buffers in using single process versus three processes or two processes, four, four processes, four, four workers or more, uh, it's different, right? So we, we need to understand like timing will be affected by parallelism. But still, uh, it's interesting to see overhead and so on. So buffers uh, analysis uh, is important, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. In fact, there's a few, few tips. So when we're talking about this, we're probably talking about looking at explain plans. Um, probably talking about doing uh, so we we get information about parallelism through explain, explain and can, analyze buffers right explain yes but but initially just explain you can see whether the whether the planner is is it's going uh, to, to, to is, use exactly uh, not just is going to use it but how many workers it will request as well so you can get some information right. about um, how much parallelism so it doesn't have to max out your uh, the option it, it can choose anything between zero and your 
uh, well, it, initially max work, max parallel workers per gather um, at right. each for each gather or gather merge. So yeah, there's that. But then additionally, I wanted to say that verbose is quite important here as well. If you want to see mm. some of the, like the per the per process statistics, verbose is quite a useful st- the, yeah, the thing. Good point. So what I've like, let me finish my thought. Probably yes, I was not sorry. Uh, of, of course, if you, if we need, for example, to read uh, to deal with uh, hundred uh, buffers, for example, again, uh, currently, if we forget about vacuum, we, we should discuss vacuum and create index and dump restores separately, which have parallelization. And I'm check we mentioned last time. Well, let's let's talk about them separately. But uh, for normal queries, DML queries, it's only for, about reads. So, for, exa- for example, if we need to deal with thousand buffers originally fetched. Uh, from uh, heap using sequential scan or from index using index scan, index only scan, or also uh, uh, bitmap scan. We understand that, okay, if we have three workers, will it be three times faster? And here, to, to, it's interesting to see overhead and buffers uh, option will also provide us some additional insight about overhead uh, of, of parallel versus non-parallel and parallel with how many workers. And uh, when planner chooses uh, plan, it all only uh, takes two kinds of input uh, besides query itself. First is statistics for all tables involved, mm-hmm. and second, uh, uh, second uh, planner settings and work map. Planner settings from PG settings, you have category, special category about planner settings. You can, uh, and there are some settings uh, related to uh, parallelism. Yeah. Actually, work memes are really good. It's, it's an important point Super here. If, important. If, yeah, if you're going to change your parallelism settings, you also need to consider your work mem setting at the same time. Like and imagine... You, oh, so, sorry for interrupting. I've, no, no, no. Uh, I, I, only, I only wanted to make... It, like, why, why am I saying that? It's because uh, most people realize that work mem can be used multiple times in a query if you have... Uh, multiple hashes or multiple sort operations, work mem can be used multiple times. That's why it's a a scary parameter to set and why people often go relatively conservative, but they want to bump it up so that operations can happen in memory. Once you introduce further parallelism, that multiplies. So you can have each each parallel sort can be, like each parallel uh, operation that is using work mem can use it the number of times that there are workers. So it, it multiplies quickly. Uh, so if you're going to bump that number up, uh, it's something to be aware of. And it might be an argument for reducing it sometimes. Maybe you can you can get away with a higher work mem setting uh, for your entire workload if you reduce it. But like, like work mem, if you do have the odd really big query that you need to run, you can set some of these settings locally, right? Oh, like for, on a session level. So work mem is super interesting topic and uh, we mm-hmm. need a couple of minutes to discuss it. But before that, let, okay. let me um, let me mention what like I understand about uh, which read queries can be uh, paral- paralyzed in Postgres. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, if you want to benefit the most, you need uh, the most recent version because each version had improvements. Yes, since makes 10, sense. like 10, 11, 12, all of them had improvements. Second, uh, uh, the most like the easiest is a uh, sequential scan and index scan and bitmap scan. They all can be like parallel. Yep. And it's quite obvious because, well, index is more complex, but uh, still can be parallelized, all good. Uh, we can benefit a lot. And if we expect only a few users using our 96 core or maybe 244 AMD, uh, epic uh, milan core, core uh, cpu so many core, uh, cores of course and only like if we have vi- like this beast uh, running postgres 15 and only 10 users like doing some analytical queries we definitely need to reconsider and uh, increase uh, max workers per gather max uh, there there is one set settings mark max working processes which requires restart all others don't require restart and max um, max workers mark max, max worker, worker processes. processes yeah right but there's also involves, max power. <laughs> it's usually increased also for logical replication but in this mm-hmm. case if you expect heavy queries and only a few users using some beast uh, machine you need to increase it a lot and this requires restart mm-hmm. everything else can be adjusted later and dynamically in session to, to experiment and so on and in, of course, like, like okay, these like access method uh, nodes, 
in plan which are live live lives in in our explained plan uh, it's re relatively straightforward but then interesting like aggregates uh, joins right these operations are interesting uh, and uh, um in 10 hash join was or merge join was supported like in later yep. couple of years later in 12 maybe i don't remember exactly um uh, uh Hash join was supported as well, but they have some difficulties, right? And and also, I see in release notes of sixteen, which is uh, it's already beta, right? Beta was released uh, last week, I guess. Uh, full outer join also can be parallelized and so on. It's interesting. And if you if you see like about joins, it's it's also possible. About aggregates, it's also possible. So, but things become much more difficult there. And now memory. Uh, mm -hmm. Memory, even without parallelism, is so tricky in Postgres memory mm -hmm. management. What uh, what backend developer expects? I say, okay, uh, I have uh, 600 gigabytes. 25% uh, of that goes to shared buffers and also 200 gigabytes probably or maybe like 300 gigabytes I'm ready to uh, to give to normal query processing. Everything else will be second uh, underlying layer of caching which is page cache mm -hmm. i want some setting i want to say like okay, 200 gigabytes can be used by postgres there is no such setting and it's so hard to understand how like if we set up a new server it's so hard to predict how much memory it will be using it's super hard. well i think a lot of people don't even realize what the what happens if it goes wrong so like it's we're talking out of memory, like uh, everything shuts down. Like that's the, the it, failure. It depends. Case. We, we can enable swapping, and some people uh, advise to enable it or enable a small small swap uh, for protection. But in general, uh, yes, it's not good position. You either be uh, either server goes down or you are becoming very very slow. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So latency spike, you have latency spike, it's not good. You you don't you definitely don't want even uh, out of memory killer to be involved or uh, to be very slow. So you don't want to be out of memory. But how to properly plan it? M memory planning is super difficult topic. Maybe we should allocate for it a special episode. But uh, in few words, you take work mem. Oh, of course, uh, there is a maintenance work mem and auto vacuum work mem, which is by default uh, is inherited by maintenance work mem. So if you understand how many um, workers can build indexes, and index, uh, this can be paralyzed as well, which is good. And uh, also you know how many auto vacuum workers, you have max work, max auto vacuum workers, uh, which is by default three, not enough for modern hardware at all. So you allocate some uh, to work on max workers, you increase it. So you can plan this part relatively easy. It's simple. But mm -hmm. normal query processing, DML processing, it's super complicated. So you take work mem, and then you should understand work mem is what uh, not single session can consume, but uh, it can consume multiple times of work mem because it, it's uh, how, my, how much memory is allowed uh, to be consumed by or, uh, ordering and join operations, hashing operations, which is becomes very complicated. Okay, one query can have multiple joins, and uh, so, so it can consume multiple times of work mem. For safety, you need to take work mem and multiply, for example, by two or three. But in, but in reality, it never it's never allocated uh, as a whole. Usually, it's mm -hmm. like some part of it. So you need to understand your workload on production to make proper decisions. And I see many servers are like kind of over provisioned because they know that queries, most of the queries are, are relatively uh, light. So they don't reach even one work man for, sing, for single query. So it's good to have max, uh, max connections, like they allow max connections uh, quite a lot. Like to, there are many reasons to try to reduce max connections, especially for older Postgres. But in general, you need to take max connections, multiply by, by work mem, and also by two or three. Because there is some like uncertainty how many, uh, 
how many gigab megabytes can be used by single session. But, but of course, uh, worth mentioning, uh, default work memory, if I'm not mistaken, it's four megabytes, maybe bytes. It's for uh, teapot Postgres. Yeah, it's too small. But right. even... So but, 100 meg mix is good. Well, for yeah, for, for big ones. But I think, I, I think if I was setting defaults, I might try and argue for a bump to 16 at least like i feel like there's almost no like even for tiny depends instances on your resources. But i know it depends i know i know and it, we should probably go back to parallelism right um, so this i i wanted to draw this picture really quickly and uh, mm -hmm. then we add parallelism here it means that our max uh, max connections which for example is uh, 300 for our 96 beast uh, server uh, okay we have work map 100 max and uh, we for safety we multiply by two or three it gives uh, uh, 100 max times roughly 100 it's 10 gigs already and max connections uh, is uh, 300 i said like it's already it's already too much too much right Way too so much. probably you should re reduce work mem but in reality you see it's never achieved so you you like yeah. real mem memory consumption is good so you try to increase it to avoid temporary files but parallelism what does parallelism parallelism give brings what does it bring to to this picture it brings more complexity because it said okay now each session I'll, uh, every each uh, session out of our 300 or 500 max connections can have multiple parallel workers and consume even more work mem, right? And for safety, you need to multiply by expected number of parallel workers on average, which you, you also hard to predict without observing in reality uh, real production behavior. So you have two multipliers now. Yeah, that, and that was my point. I think people are often kind of aware of the status quo but if they change this setting they might not think to read to change the other one as well so it's yeah so uh, my, my main point is that uh if you if you like i do some consulting my my team does some consulting mm -hmm. and we say okay if you want to be uh, super safe you need to use these multi multipliers but but you will end up uh, having a lot of temporary files unfortunately later you can is... start like in iterations you can adjust and try to get rid of uh, temporary files going maybe to unsafe space theoretically but practically you see that your workload is good you i mean yeah. you still have a lot of uh, free memory which is used by page cache so also you don't need to steal all bytes all gigabytes from page cache so this is approach this is, this is theoretical safe approach but uh, it's very wasteful in terms of memory because nice. uh, and, and and leading to uh, to uh, latency overhead because of temporary files so parallelism gives complexity to this picture definitely oh there is also a multiplier for for hash uh, okay it's yeah hash mem different. hash mem multiplier but it's <laughs> if you're thinking about work mem hopefully you're thinking about that as well um because it's in the docs in the same place and stuff so yeah, yeah. that's Complex. two now by default yeah um, another tip, like, well, before we move off, so parallel query, um, if you notice, like, if you have a query plan that's not parallel or something you you think should be, uh, one, like, one thing, for example, to be aware of is that user-defined functions by default are not mm. marked parallel safe. So that catches mm. a lot of people out. So um, you need to explicitly mention that those are parallel safe. That was another And they like, should be in parallel seen. safe as well, right? If also, they are parallel safe, yeah. Also, the, the, you probably deal with very small table, uh, tiny table, tiny index. So there are two thresholds defining, uh, like below which, these two thresholds, one is for table, one is for index. Below them, it cannot be... You can adjust them and go down if you think it's worth, uh, but depends again. Yeah, good point. So you will never... like If you don't change any settings, you'll never see a parallel scan on a tiny table. Oh, by the way, you know what? Like CPU... Is one reason we mm -hmm. discussed it. Uh, uh, CPU development dictates software development. Mm -hmm. SSD disks also, but memory we have some like it's so 
uh, affordable hundreds of gigabytes now. Well, uh, it depends, of course, but, right, but yeah. right. But if your startup which grows really quick, like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you need to, you have some money, but you you cannot be slow, right? So you sometimes prefer just up, uh, scaling vertically and uh, putting whole database or major part of it to to mem uh, to memory, right? It's also it's possible. I mean, right in clouds. Yeah. It's definitely it's one of options which we have, and it, it it's quick. I mean, it's quick and uh, affordable. Of course, it requires some additional budgets, and uh, also this is very closely co connected to partitioning, because when I say put whole database to memory, it might might be not whole database but working set, and if you have tables partitioned, you probably have some old partitions which be out of memory. And you have fresh partitions which are in memory, and you start benefiting from 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 parallelism because you don't touch disk and so and so on. And work with memory, of course, uh, can be well parallelized. Unlike well, this feels uh, like a, magnetic disks, right? So, is that a good transition onto things like parallelism for create index and yeah, vacuum? Not, not for DDL and other yeah. So. For create index is definitely a good thing, because uh, we 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 like to recall this. You call the time drama with Postgres 14. It yeah. means that when you build, and again it's related to partitioning. Everything is related to partitioning. Everyone should partition tables which exceed 100 gigs. So mm -hmm. if you build an index over large table. And we, as we discussed in our episode about index maintenance, we definitely want to rebuild indexes uh, from time to time because their health uh, ten, tends to degrades. degrade. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, de it, it degrades slow, slowly in modern Postgres, like 14, 15, True. but uh, so. much, it, things are much worse in older Postgres versions. Mm -hmm. So while you rebuild index, uh, XMIN Horizon has been held. Uh, Auto vacuum cannot delete freshly the tuples. And uh, blood is accumulated eventually. Uh, mm -hmm. Attempt to improve it in Postgres 14, 14 was reverted in 14.4. So it means that you want your index build to go faster because uh, if you move faster, fewer right transactions, concurrent sessions, produce dead tuples. Mm -hmm. If you move faster, if you have room, of course, if you have power in terms of uh, CPUs and uh, disk. Right, so you move faster, fewer dead tuples generated, and uh, less bloat is produced eventually when AutoVacuum cl cleans those dead tuples. Makes sense, right? So you want to go faster, but of course you don't want to saturate your IOPS limits, for example, or uh, th uh, disk throughput and IOPS and so on. So, yeah. Uh, what else? And of course, CPU. If you if you rebuild ten indexes in parallel, like uh, and uh, they are also parallelized, having multiple work, more workers, and it's like dozens of uh, backends uh, are working on index maintenance. Uh, you are going to probably also saturate your CPUs, which is also like not good. So it's this needs careful planning, probably during weekend, moving. Fast enough, but not saturating anything. Control of utilization of CPU and disk IO here is the key. So, but it's a great feature because you can rebuild index faster, especially if it's on on build on large table. It's good. Then uh, what else? Vacuum. Unfortunately, vacuum is parallelization works only for indexes and only for explicit vacuum. Auto vacuum cannot do it still. And maybe I'm, I missed something, but uh, it's only for your manually invoked uh, vacuum runs. But if a table has multiple indexes, it's quite often. Right? The yeah. indexes can be processed uh, using additional uh, workers, which is a really good thing. I, I hope eventually vacuum will be paralyzed even for a single table. But you know, like in general, again, partitioning is important because you can parallelize processing using just multiple workers. It's if you deal with multiple partitions, even with for auto vacuum. In this case, this feature for explicit vacuum command, uh, which uh, applies only to specific tables indexes, you don't care. You, we have many workers. We have a lot of partitions. We can process them 
uh, using AutoVacuum, and that's it. This is the way to parallelize it in practice if you have a lot of cores. And all yeah, and I think defaults in these areas are still quite low for most people, like in terms tip, of like auto Tipot settings. Yeah. Tip yeah. So, yeah. Um, cool. What about Analyze, actually? I, don't, I didn't look it up, but uh, you're talking about uh, vacuum, I wonder... Again, like I think a, a single table an, analyze for single table, it, it's not. I think I, as I remember, it's not paralyzed. Yeah, okay. uh, it might be, but but the the key here I didn't is find it. Yeah, the key here is again uh, we usually rely either on uh, auto vacuum, so we need more workers. Mm -hmm. uh, like uh, my my recommendation is to consider uh, like you have number of cores, take b something between ten percent up to maybe. 30 40 percent of them and this is your to vacuum because if you think any rights uh, they just mark x, x max or like then we need to really process it and you need to allocate a significant amount of resources for that uh, to, to manage your rights right so you definitely need to increase uh, to vacuum max workers three is not enough if you have dozens mm -hmm. of course of hundreds of course and uh, analyze so analyze uh, either it's um, rely on your uh, to vacuum max workers, and again partitioning is good because uh, an anal analysis of large table, especially if you <coughs> globally increase the default statistics target, like some people do, it's not good. But uh, also there is important case when you want explicit analysis, especially after pitch upgrade. In this case, you run vacuum DB CLI tool, for example, uh, and with dash J. And uh, you, you're going to have problem if you have huge tables because dash J again applies uh, at upper level. It takes tables and run anal analyze on them. So if you have partitioning, you can say dash J after PG upgrade, for example, we, we, uh, we have maintenance window Right, and we can use all cores. We can saturate resources because we, mm -hmm. we want to minimize duration of maintenance window. And parallelization with vacuum DB dash J, you take number of cores, go go full speed, and then you are limited again. Similar to my example with pitcher dump, you are limited with like largest table size. That's why also important to partition because in this case physical tables, they will be much smaller and parallelization will work much better. Right, yeah. so that's you need to shrink those tables to pieces. Nice, uh, and we can link up our episode on partitioning as well. Right, um, yes, it's, it's very note, related to parallelization. Right? Yeah. On that note, um, are there any other like for further reading, or if anybody wants to learn more about this, where would you point them? Oh, by the way, it's not only related to parallelization, but it's also related to uh, DML to reads. Uh, if you select from many partitions. It's, uh, you need a uh, constant exclusion. You need to, to deal with as few partitions as possible. And also, uh, parallel workers might help you there as well. Definitely. To read from different partitions and then to uh, um, aggre aggregate result. Yeah, I haven't studied, I haven't actually looked into that, but it's still using the same like worker processes, right? Like it's still doing the right. same parallel scans. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that if you need to deal with many partitions in your query, multiple workers can be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. It's a very related right. topic. Partitioning is very related to parallelism, obviously. Yeah. So, so what really... can we cover? Create index cover, analyze cover, what else? Yeah. I think I think we should leave it there. I think we've done it. No, no, I dump restore really is good. important. Pitch dump supports okay. DJ, but Pitch Restorer also supports DJ. And there are improvements. I don't remember. If you check release notes, at some version, some fixes were done. So in newer versions, it works better. Also, there is work with uh, foreign data wrappers and so on. It can be some, something can be paralyzed, but I don't remember details about it. I don't think... Yeah, I think, I think there was some... Uh, all I could find on it... Were, well, there were a few improvements so that you could push, that, push things down. But I think that the... Postgres phone data wrapper, for example, doesn't support it by default, but you can, there is a fork of it by Swarm64, um, but I'm not, I, I think that was experimental when they got sold, so I don't, I don't know any more about that. Oh, by on, the way. On that note, though. Yeah, sorry. On that note, there is a really good talk by somebody that used to work at Swarm64 called Sebastian that I'll link up. I think it's, a, it's parallelism, do's and don'ts, and I'll, I'll link that up. It's about oh, an hour, yeah. I think. I didn't, I don't remember it. 
uh, uh, worth mentioning also. So I would like to have copy parallelized. Sometimes it's you need to deal with single large table. Mm-hmm. And PGD store parallelization applies only at like higher level, so between tables. So if you have two tables, you can probably move two times faster, roughly. But if you have single table copy, parallel copy would be interesting feature. And I like you can cook it yourself. Dump restore with dealing with snapshots and so on. Uh, like uh, knowing your IDs, you can split your table and so on. It's possible. But also there is a create table S, uh, which is parallelized. Yeah. So and also much less use uh, creation of yep. them uh, with uh, initialization of data uh, and refreshing. And, sorry it's okay and refreshing materialized views as well but yeah I think sorry, and done... also refresh materialized view also can be yeah. that's it well, maybe something else I'm sure of something else uh, check those notes a lot of things were that absolutely also for, for anybody looking at the like wanting a recap of the basics I did also have a blog post on like for people that did want to increase max par- max parallel works per gather and the basics around that, I think we've covered it all here. Um, but that's a shorter summary. <laughs> there are sure. many, many nuances there, but yeah, it's mm-hmm. experiment. Wonderful. Cool. Mm-hmm. So, well, thank you, Nikolai. Thank you for the people that requested this. Um, and I'll see you next week. I have strong feeling we didn't cover everything, but I I, I hope we we like did good overview. Well, things yeah, that can absolutely. be explored further, mm-hmm. and w- I expect many more features in the future because it's obviously a huge topic and very important one for modern hardware. Thank you so much. Thank you, all listeners. See you next time. Bye. See you. Bye.